Hi, Jonathan. Hi, can you hear me? Definitely can hear you. Can you hear us? It sounds like you can. I can, I can. Hi. Hi. So, Cindy, I listen to your podcast all the time. Oh, your, your friend Alice Hoffman recently. That yes. was that was fun. And uh, Tess Gerritsen, I remember what else. Oh, uh, Leonard Lemer, because the Hitchcock Blondes, because I'm this huge Hitchcock freak. He's even influenced my writing. So... That's great. Uh, we yeah. can't see you. Are you going to turn your... Oh, wait. You can't see me? No. Weird. There you are. <laughs> I there was I like, am. we can hear you, but it would be oh, really okay. I'm you. sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I, I could see, see unfortunately, I could see myself, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I understand how that works. So good. Now we can see you. Hello. Uh, right. Yes, I really liked. Um, that's the second time I've, inter I've interviewed Larry Lamer. He is great. I also interviewed him for the Truman Capote book that he uh, that he oh, did, which was really good. If you like his writing. Um, yeah, I do. And that would be I have, you know, I didn't really know him until this book. And I read it because of your uh, podcast. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. He he's really nice. I like him a lot. Uh, and I learned so much about Hitchcock from that book. I don't know yeah. if you all have listened to that interview yet, but he he really did a deep dive into the filming of some of the movies. And I was telling my husband so many stories as I read that book. I was like, oh, my gosh, the poor woman. Um, now I'm blanking on her name. The, the birds uh, know her name. Hedren. Yes, Tippy Hedren, yeah. like, oh my gosh. And that was the best story to open with that for that book, for oh, his book, because it was know. such a hook. I was like, okay. He really uh, tortured her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really did. Yeah. So we've been enjoying chatting about your book. So thank you for joining us. Nice to be here. You're in uh, Houston, right? I'm in Houston and we're kind of all over. A couple of people are also in Houston and then... Um, at, at Nebraska and Richmond, and I'm trying to think of where everybody is, and uh, New York, so kind of all over. Uh-huh. <clears throat> nice. Where are you? I am in um, <clears throat> New York, in Manhattan. I'm, I I live on, I don't know if you know it, on West 28th Street between 6th and 7th, which is the flower market. Oh, yeah. So it's really beautiful, you know, to just go out my door and the whole street is filled with flowers and trees and plants and so it doesn't feel like in a way like you're in the city you know so it's kind of what convinced me when I first saw this place this loft oh that's great my daughter is at Barnard so I get up to New York City a fair amount oh I taught at Barnard at Columbia and Barnard. Oh, you did <clears throat> I did like a long time ago but I was in the art department and I I just loved it I thought those were the greatest students I've ever had. So. She loves it. She toured it. Actually, when my older daughter first looked at it, and then um, she just fell in love with it. We toured it again, and she's like, that's where I want to go. And there wasn't even another choice. So it's yeah. been a good fit. It's a great school. I, I tried to convince my daughter to do go there, but she was like, I'm not staying home. What if I bump into you in the city? It would be awful. I'm like, okay, okay. You know. Yeah, we have rice really close to us. And I'm always trying to convince my kids to go to rice. And they're the same way. They're like, it's five minutes from the house. I was like, yeah, I right, know. Right. Um, yeah, they want to escape. So I, I understood, you know. Well, tell us about why Van Gogh and all the cool stuff that either you knew about Van Gogh and put in your book or you learned about Van Gogh as you were writing it. We were all totally enthralled with all of that. Um, well, I'm glad. I mean, you know, I've always loved Van Gogh. I mean, he's just, um, I think the conversation that Luke and, um, you know, Alex have about him and the whole romance of Van Gogh, I mean, how many artists have songs written about them? You know, not a lot. And so he's kind of this mythological figure. And for me, even as a kid, well, first of all, I loved the paintings. And I remember, you know, going to the Metropolitan and seeing these paintings that were sort of like nobody else's, you know, like that heavily ladled paint. And you could feel his hand moving on the canvas. And and I just got interested in him. And and then I read a lot about him. And of course, he was this sort of tragic figure, uh, which particularly appealed to my probably tragic teenage self, 
you know, which then I grew out of and realized that he was a, this amazing, wonderful painter. And I sort of had the, you know, I had started a totally different book, which I'll tell you at another time, but um, I loved the idea of discovering a painting under a painting. And like many artists, particularly when Van Gogh had no money, he reused canvases. So he had many paintings that were buried under his own paintings. And a lot of artists do that. Um, and some use painting, you know, canvases they have of other artists or, you know, they buy, you know, like art forgers go to flea markets to buy old canvases, scrape them down to, to, to paint on top of them. But um, I kind of felt like I wanted to use, have Van Gogh as the artist that I could, because it would give the book a kind of immediate weight and understanding, because, you know, everybody knows Van Gogh. I, I mean, I think everyone knows him. And so he's an emotional painter. And the book was uh, kind of an emotional book for me. Uh, so I think that's why I was, I thought about using him and um, I didn't know everything about him at all. I mean, I read, hold on, I'm going to move to show you this. I don't know if anybody, this book is 976 pages. I mean, it's, it's a doorstopper. Um, but the, the the thing about you notice all my like ridiculous post-its and stuff I, I mean I read it I read it more than once which shows you how obsessive I am with research but it's actually fun because it's filled with stories these these guys are two guys who collaborated and wrote this book they also wrote a book on Jackson Pollock which won a Pulitzer Prize and this is just like everything you ever wanted to know about Van Gogh from like the minute he's born, his, his pastor father, his brother, his sister, you know, everything about them and all the phases he went through in his life. And I'll tell you a little secret, which is that there was another section of the book that moved through the book, which was from Van Gogh telling his own story in little segments. And I took it out because there was just too many there were too many stories in the book and it really was not important to what the book was about but i'm thinking about a couple of things either publishing it as a little chat book or i think i may just post parts of these on my website because i really love them but first my agent who reads everything i do read it and said you know i really love those van gogh sections but they've got to go They've got to go. They're just, you know. And then my editor read them and she said, oh, I love those sections. You got to cut them. So, <laughs> you know, I did. I, I, I mean, I respect these two people and I knew they were right. Uh, but, you know, like, like a lot of writers or artists, you know, you fall in love with things in your work and you, you're very close to it. Um, and so they were there up until pretty late. But the book is much better without them. Um, I think what, you know, also, Cindy, part of it is maybe I was showing off with all my research. Do you know, I had done so much research on Van Gogh that I was, I couldn't wait to stick it all in there somehow. And yet, you know, from reading the book, that's not, it's not really that important, you know. Um, it becomes important to he and Alex, particularly when she's, you know, at the end, after she's reading that that diary. Uh, and so I had a way of using some of it there. Um, and all of that is from research. So it's it's not anything I made up, you know. And everybody's read the book, so I'm not, no spoiler, right? right? Yes, no, so, everyone has read the book and you can talk about anything. Well, oh, but I okay. think that's gotta be the hardest part is you do all this research, you've learned so many cool details and you wanna include them all. I mean, that that has to be one of the harder parts, I think, paring that down. Well, you know, it's true of every book. You know, it just is. Um, I think it's true if you think of, you know, I have a lot of artist friends and I think about how, you know, you make a painting and things get buried or they get terped out. And, you know, we're all very interested in those ghosts and the process. And I am, I love it. Um, 
but you know it's that famous thing you have to kill your darlings you know to make make the book work so i think every single book i'm a kind of obsessive rewriter and editor and so you know if i took all of that stuff i've cut from my books i could easily fill a library with things that people would say oh he he was smart to cut this you know so <laughs> I don't, but uh you know, once I cut something, for the most part, I, I don't miss it anymore. It kind of feels like, okay, that's gone, and I just don't think about it. If these Van Gogh little first-person narratives, I only think about them because they were really fun to write, and they're a separate book. So I, I will I will give them to you know, somehow on my website or in some little thing, uh, I'll, I'll put them out there. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, I just, I love the research and uh, I, I love going places for every book, you know, to, to find out more and more and more. So. Well, I don't want to ask all the questions. I have a bunch, but I want to give everybody else some time to ask questions. Does sure. anybody want to ask anything? You may have to. Ask. I wanted to ask about um, your, it, you talk about Amsterdam and bring it to life so vividly in the book. So can you talk about your process? Did you go there a lot or have you, and to, how do you, how you brought that into the book? Yeah, um, that's my, that's a great question because it's my favorite part of every single book is, you know, as I say to people, gee, it was really awful. You know, I had to go live in Florence for a month for my last, for the, you know, the last Mona Lisa, or, oh boy, it's such a hardship. I have to go to Paris, you know, but this book, it was, um, I hadn't been to Amsterdam for probably 20 something, 25 years. And so I had a memory of it and, but I didn't know it really well. And, you know, when you go someplace with the idea that you're writing about it, it's totally different. And I enjoy it in a very different way because I kind of, you know, I go to see everything I've been writing about. I make a zillion notes and I realize, oh, I, I, I kind of had this wrong. You know, I think even in the book, I if I write, I think um, Luke says that he had this other idea of Amsterdam that it was this small kind of precious city. And, and it's not, you know, it's a big cosmopolitan city. It's really busy. If you don't look where you're going, there are trams and buses and 8 million people on bicycles about to knock you over. Uh, I, I love it. And I loved being there. You know, I, I stayed there. I made two trips. Um, I have this good friend who actually plays a part in the book. It's the first time I've given him a role. He's Luke's friend, the auction art, the art person who, who puts him together with his art dealer. So that's based on this from my very good friend, Judd Tully, who is like the world's auction expert. The reason I'm telling you that is no matter where I go, because he travels for art auctions, he knows every, he seems to know everyone. So I said, well, you know, I'm going to Amsterdam and, you know, I've been dealing with, you know, Nazi looted art. And he says, oh, well, you know, you have to go meet this friend of mine whose grandfather owned Dr. Gachet. And, you know, and I do. And I went and met her and we had dinner. We actually had two dinners. Um, she hasn't read the book yet. And she is a template for Caroline. So I'm kind of always a little bit nervous what people are going to think, you know. Um, but, you know, I really think you if you're going to write about someplace, you have to go there. Because even if you, you know, if you go on the internet and we can all do that and you want, you know, you can wander through the streets, you can't smell it, you can't eat, you don't really get a feeling of what the people are like or, um, and I, you know, I, I made friends, I mean, because I was there for a while and uh, it was, it's a great city. I mean, I, I, I really love it. And, you know, I'm sure you know this from going to just a different town, a different city, every place and cities, they have a feel about them, you know, e even if they have different sections to them, like New York does or Houston does or anywhere, 
but there's a feel to the place that you can't get unless you spend time there you know when i um when i wrote the last mona lisa um my agent when she read a draft said you need to go back to florence and i was very insulted but uh and i after i got off the phone i said to my daughter oh, well jane just told me i have to go to florence and my daughter said so go i'm like what do you mean i have a million things to do and, and you know she got on my computer and she said well what are you doing and, and she immediately she like found an airbnb on the street where Luke stays in the hotel in that book. And it was extraordinary, you know, and I had a lot of things wrong, even though I had been to Florence, I had never gone there as research. So that's a long winded answer. Um, but, you know, I, I sometimes think, oh, I can't wait for my next book to go someplace that I wanna go, <laughs> you know, so it's the really fun part. Yeah, so have you been to Amsterdam? I have, yes. And so yeah. I just picture it in my head and, and you described it so well. I've been to the Anne Frank house. And so I just love that aspect because that was what that really spoke to me um, when I was there. So I love seeing it in the book. Yeah, thank you. You know, um, that's another example of this friend of mine told me to get in touch with somebody that he knew at the Anne Frank house. And I did. And uh, so I met with a curator there and he took me through it alone and then through back rooms where nobody gets to go, but that's not, and that was extraordinary, but it wasn't the way I knew my characters would experience it. So I then went through, you know, as everyone does. And, you know, what's interesting is going through it with a crowd, the the kind of feeling that you get from everybody who's experiencing it with you. It's very quiet. Um, I found, you know, remarkable. So, yeah, yeah, it's a great place to go, I think. So, thanks. Anybody else? Well, one of the questions I had for you when I was reading your bio was you are a, and I'm going to make sure I get this correct. Um, you are involved in the legal forgery business. You have painted paintings. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm dying to hear more about this. I mean, I know it happens. I just want to to understand like yeah. how it happens. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated. Well, let's, yeah, let's not call them forgeries. Well, I was just going by your bio. I would. Well, I know. No, you're. I'm being. <laughs> I was I'm like, being kind of I'm not. Funny. I'm not trying to. <laughs> you know, I I started um, before I was a, a writer. I was a painter. I went to art school, which means I was totally uneducated. You know, I mean, I loved art school. I tricked my parents. They said I couldn't go to an art school. I had to go to a university, so I did. I went to Boston University School of Fine Arts. But the truth is, Boston that's a really old fashioned art school. And I think I had one English course, one history course, and it was all art or art history. And it was, it was fantastic. You know, I just, but I did come out rather uneducated. I had to educate myself later, but my point is that I was a painter for many years and um, had a, had a really kind of lucky and astonishing career. And then my life changed unexpectedly as as life does but i i had a um i was having a retrospective show which i did not want to have i had changed the date like three times my gallery in new york was setting it up and it was at a small museum in chicago um and so they collected 10 years of my work plus my newest, latest six paintings. So all this work was borrowed back from collectors and some museums. And the show opened on a Friday night and the place burned down to the ground the next day. Oh so no. I, I lost 10 years of work like in a, in a moment. And you know, that's a long time ago now, it's 25 years ago. Um, at the time, you know, you, you had to, kind of my wife had to sort of pick me up off the floor but now um the reason i'm telling you this is how i got into making legal forgeries but um 
what I was going to say is that now I don't recommend a fire, but it changed my life in the most, <laughs> you know, kind of in the most remarkable way because I had been writing for art magazines and writing, you know, cultural pieces, but I never thought I'd write a novel. And what after the fire, I had been invited uh, to the American Academy in Rome, which was this amazing honor. And we went, my daughter was nine years old and my wife and I, and it was like probably when I think about it, the most blessed year of, of our life, you know? I mean, we were taken care of, we lived at <clears throat> in an apartment across the street from the American Academy up on Trist in Trastevere, overlooking all of Rome. I mean, it was just, but here's the bad news. I was there as a painter and I had trouble painting because I'd lost all this work. And I did, I made a lot of copies, but I also started my first serious novel while I was there. But what I started doing was making copies of paintings. Um, I would go to churches every day and make copies of every painting and drawing I saw. And when I got home, I was continuing my work. I also continued this novel, but I started making art about art. So I started imitating other artists and using it in paintings. And then oddly, this collector who I didn't know saw one of my pieces that did this. It had a little Franz Klein abstract painting tucked into a painting. And he saw it at a friend's house and he called me up and said, could you make a Franz Klein for me? And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, I've been bidding, on, I bid on a Franz Klein at a Sotheby's auction and I lost it. And I'd like you to duplicate that painting. And I said, well, I, I can, but there are sort of laws that govern that, you know, I have to change the material, I have to do this. Anyway, I, I made that painting for him and it started this, you know, lots of people saw it in his house and I just continued doing that for people. Like people would call me up and they'd say, well, could you do a Rothko for me? And I'd say, uh-huh. And then they'd ask me, you know, can you do, by the way, I've never done a Van Gogh. That's interesting. Oh, really? Can you, can you do this? Can you do, and yes, and I just did it. And I, I love doing it because it's kind of, the experience is like, slipping inside another artist, you know, and really studying their work and, and, and figuring it out. Of course, mine are fake. So, you know, if I'm doing like an abstract expressionist, like de Kooning, who I love to fake, you know, it's like his brushstrokes are slashing all over the place and I'm painting them in with little brushes, you know, so it's, it's completely created, but, uh, so I only do a couple of those a year and I'm doing less and less, I have to say, um, because I spend more time on my writing, but I do, I did one hmm, through the pandemic, this, this man collector got in touch with me and wanted me to make a copy of this like 15 foot mural that had been in a hotel in Atlantic City that he and his wife had visited on their honeymoon. And so I made that painting and and it was a, a lot of work, but fun. But anyhow, um, just to say, I tell them ahead of time, I'm gonna sign my name on the back. I'm gonna hide my initials somewhere in the painting. Um, you can tell your friends whatever you'd like to tell them, but if you try and sell this, of course it's gonna be discovered because I'm using modern contemporary paints and they'll figure it out in two seconds, you know, that it's a forgery. Um, but, you know, it gives me a lot of insight into things I write about. Uh, so I loved in, in The Last Mona Lisa, I got I had to write about an art forger and I I just knew what it was like, you know. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I remember the first forgery I did, my daughter, she was, I don't know, 16 or so. She said, you know, daddy, why don't you just sell this as the real thing? And I said, honey, I am wasting my money on your education. I will be in jail. What are you talking about? You know, but I did, I didn't think, by the way, I didn't think I would be continuing to do that. So um, I, I draw every day for myself because I'm not 
a serious, I don't seriously pursue being an artist anymore, but because I, my writing career is my serious, to me, my serious career. Um, but I do these, um, I do these forgeries for people. They're fun to do. Oh, I bet they are. I was just fascinated by that because I do think there seems to be a booming business for that. And we were also talking, yeah. Valerie was mentioning she'd read a book where sometimes museums will have a forgery done and that's what they hang up and they save the, you know, so there's just there's obviously a business for it. And I was just kind of curious how you how you got into it. Well, you know, the, a lot of people who get in touch with me are, are donating a painting to a museum and they want a copy to keep. And, and I do that for them. So, um, and I make an exact replica. So, and if it's in their home, that's fine. You know, if something goes into the public, it has to be a little more obvious that it's a, it's a copy. That's yeah. all. You know, and as so. you said, I mean, it's pretty easy for anybody who's going to investigate to be like, okay, this is not the same thing oh, yeah. that used in Van Gogh yeah. or whoever's yeah. time. I mean, I always find it amazing that any art forgeries, I mean, and there's tons of stories, you know, um, may get through at all, because all you have to do is scrape off a little paint, put it under a micro, you know, microscope, put a blue light on it, and you discover that it's, you know, made with titanium white which wasn't invented until the 50s and if it's a painting from 1940 there you go uh but you know all of that stuff and I guess my training in art really um I mean it obviously infuses my books and uh you know it's just part of what I'm interested in so you know like it with with Van Gogh I I, I did do my own fake of a Van Gogh you know because I wanted to feel <clears throat> what those heavy brush strokes were like, you know, as he defines a form. Um, just because I, it's like I want, you know, I did drawings for the last, I do that wherever I go, I do sketches. And it's because I, it helps me see a place and understand a place a little bit. So, because I think, I tend to think in pictures, you know, so. We were talking about how much we loved all of your work in the back of the book and how much that added to be able to kind of see some of the things that you had created in the back and that we wish that that was more common in books. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. That um, that's because my editor, um, <clears throat> I sh just she was here visiting me in my studio and I had a sketchbook of these things from, you know, the drawings I made in Amsterdam and in um uh uh over series and then i had a few of them that i had taken out and pinned up and she said can't we put some of these in the book and i said why don't you choose what you like so she chose the pictures that are in the book um and um, i think i'm also for my website i'll put a few more but i'll also put like <clears throat> all the pictures of you know where van gogh worked and his room in Aubert Suisse, where he lived for the last 70 days of his life. And so people can go on that journey, you know, with me as as they go through the book or after they read the book, you know. So well, and talking about his last days, I had no idea there was any dispute about the way he died. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, uh, many people will disagree with what I've proposed. Um, this this colossal book actually is convinced he was murdered and that the story I tell in the book um, about the boys visiting for the summer who shoot him either accidentally or however it happened, they are convinced that's exactly what happened, that there were too many things that made it uh, not feasible for him to have been trying to kill himself. Nobody shoots themselves in the stomach, uh, or almost nobody, I think. Um, the fact that he was not where they think people who believe the suicide story place him in this field, but he wasn't. He was in the back of a farm, actually. And as I say in the book, his paint, his easel, everything was missing which is incredibly odd for an artist not to have done something with it. And why would he hide it? Um, also, he didn't own a gun. So, yeah, I mean, 
it, it's they convinced me for sure. They really convinced me, you know, that that he was accidentally killed. You know, it's a terrible story. And Van Gogh on his deathbed did, you know, he he said odd things like I'm not something like I I have no one to blame I have no one to accuse as if he were covering it up you know um but he had told many people that he would you know he was a very religious man and that he would never kill himself that he just it was something he would never do now the people who would argue with me and make a case would say yeah but he had incredible bad you know bouts of depression he was probably um bipolar um and so he may have done this in one of those you know very dark periods and yeah it, it's possible but the evidence i've read makes me believe that something else happened you know so that's so interesting and i just never heard that before so i, I love learning that yeah well you know i think i know for me the books i always love teach me a lot of things without making me feel like I'm learning things. You know, I, I mean, I did, uh, I, I mean, the not fun research part for this book were the 30 or so books, you know, I read on Nazi art looting, um, which were astonishing. Are, there are these incredible books, you know, that are just that taught me so much. And I had to find a way to make that accessible, you know, to people and conversational, um, not like I was teaching them things, but all of that, that information is based on fact on what, you know, I learned. Um, and uh, it, it was, a lot of that reading is pretty horrifying and pretty tough to read, but um, compelling. You know, like, I mean, the best books on it, you know, you, you can't put down in the way you can't put a novel down. So, uh, and it was, um, yeah. Anyhow, I, I just think uh, this, so, yeah, you know, as I say it to you, I think, you know, one for even you as the writer and myself, I, I forget all the things I had to do to distill, to write this book, you know? And, and the fact is, I don't want that on the page. I don't want a reader thinking, oh God, he really killed himself writing this book. That would be the worst thing in the world, you know? I don't want people to see how hard I worked. You know, it's like when I came out of art school, my mother said, you have to take me to art galleries because I don't understand art. And now you went to art school and you have, to... so I said, okay. And we went to Soho, which was at the time the big place. And I remember we went into this Robert Ryman show. It was all white on white paintings with different kinds of surfaces. And my mother was like, well, you know, they're nice white paintings, but they don't look like he worked hard. And so I said, hey, mom, you love the ballet. Do you want to see the ballerina sweat? No, you want it to be beautiful. You want it to be effortless. So I'm a believer in that. You know, I kind of try and get my you know, my agony and difficulties out of the book so that the reader can just enjoy it, you know, and, and go on that adventure with me and, you know, be bewildered and have to deal with the mystery and wonder and all of that, you know. So that to me is the, the, the fun part, not the, uh, you know, and writing is great because you're living inside your head, but it's also can be very, very hard, you know, very hard. And, and there are days that, you know, it's not fun, but yeah, so. Well, and the Nazi looting, we were talking about that too. I mean, it's such a complicated issue, not the Nazi looting part of it, but the getting the paintings back to the people they were taken from and what that looks like and, and how oh. it's handled. It's it's a complicated issue and a, and a tough issue. It's a very complicated issue. I I. I had, um, I guess Luke says that sort of toward the end, you know, he talks to the different people at the, the, the museum and the, at the restoration person, you know, when that's happening, because it's not simple. It's just not a simple thing. And, and you know, I think some people will be mad at me for 
not saying, oh, that's what it is, you know, it's X or it's Y. Well, it isn't always, you know. Um, it, and I worry that the museums are going to be empty. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, because so much of what museums have has been taken from places, you know, not necessarily stolen. I mean, the Nazi looted art is kind of, because it was programmatic, it has a, a sort of different, well, I don't know if it's different. Let me take that back. Um, it's all it's it's a murky area, let's say, you know, and it is difficult. I um I feel for the museums. I really do when they're trapped in the middle of it uh, because they're always made out to be the villain. You know, if you've seen Lady in Gold, which is a movie that's terrific, right? We were talking uh, about that, right? I mean, Helen Mirren, how could she ever do anything wrong? You know, she's so great. And, you know, the museum comes off monstrously. But of course, one has to think this is their big ticket item, you know? Right. And they've they spent move, a fortune on this stuff, yeah. you know? And it's all, a, right. And they didn't know. They right, didn't right. know. It's history, it's provenance. And also they're going to lose visitors because of that. You know, so it's complicated. A lot of, by the way, a lot of the heirs of looted art work out deals with the museums and let them keep it. Some don't, you know, don't even ask for money. They just want a plaque that says this belonged to my great grandfather. That's enough. They want the acknowledgement. Um, and I think that's, wonderful when that can happen uh, so I think it it is it's complicated it's very emotional and when anything it is an emotional issue it's even more complicated you know I mean I must say reading all of I read a lot of people's personal stories of finding their you know their family's art that had been dispersed and stolen and man those stories are really something I mean some of them are are wild and very upsetting because a lot of these heirs have done research into how their grandparents or great grandparents were killed uh so you know you're reading this and it becomes this whole other thing that you you know weren't expecting but um you know it's it, i think for me with this book as i said i was writing another book and then i became in I have a, I have di different Google alerts and they tell me a lot of art stuff. I get, I get the art newspaper. I get all kinds of things every day. And what I noticed was were these endless amounts of restitution stories. And it's just started to burrow into my head. So I abandoned the book 125 pages in Wow. And change to this one, which almost gave me and my editor a nervous breakdown, I should say. <laughs> and I might actually write that book. I don't know. I don't know. I have this huge file, Cindy, and it's it used to be unfinished books. And I changed the title on the folder recently to Books I'll Never Write because I realized I'm just not going to go back to them. You know, I, I dream about going back to them, but you know, and then I did, I did say, I don't know, I, I think, anyhow, yeah, so this, this topic kind of, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just thinking of a variety of all of the, the books that I've thrown in there that I started, or stories that I wasn't happy with, and, uh, you know, I mean, one of my friends said, I'm going to break into your computer one day and just, like, take all of those stories. I'd be my guest, you know. Like, go for it. <laughs> well, and it. The, the other idea that I think is so compelling is this idea of buying a $25 painting at a garage sale and then having it be a Van Gogh or, a, you know, whoever it's going to be. Like, wouldn't everyone love to have that happen? And it does happen. You know, it happens. I mean, it's been there's been recent stories with different things there was also somebody bought a book in like a used bookstore that had a, a bookmark that van gogh had done drawings on oh. and you know that was worth you know many hundreds of thousands of dollars but um yeah i always hope that's going to happen it hasn't happened to me but i i um i love that idea of it happening. And that that's kind of what got me going on this book. You know, the idea that, well, first of all, 
I had read those letters of Van Gogh's young artist friend, where he describes the funeral and what it's like and the different paintings. And I thought, well, what if one of these paintings that we don't know what happened to appeared or what, what, let me think about what happened to it. And I just started making notes about what could have happened to it, where it could have gone. Um, and that, that was really fun. Also, I, I just, I don't know. I hope people like the scenes. I love those scenes in the beginning when Luke is scraping the paint away and Alex is taking pictures over his shoulder and they, they discover this painting, you know, cause I can imagine I mean, I don't think it'll ever happen to me, but I can imagine it happening. I love the idea of it. You know, as you said, going to the thrift shop and buying a $25 painting and, you know, it turns out to be something amazing. So. And then what would you do? Because we talked about that too. Like, what would you do? And do you, you know, do museums have the right, I mean, it, it, do we have, the, should everybody be able to see these types of artwork? You know, should it be locked away? Like so many billionaires buying these paintings, paying more than museums can, locking them up? Or should, do they belong in museums? I mean, it's just uh, so many interesting things to ponder. Well, you know, I I wonder what people think about that. I'd be curious what, you know, the readers think, because, you know, look, I, I spent part of my life as an artist, so I love art collectors because they make it possible for artists to live. On the other hand, I'm torn because I do think that great works of art, we should all be allowed to see them, you know? I don't think they should be locked away for one person. Um, so I don't know. I mean. I know a lot of art collectors and and I um and they have a, a particular kind of mentality not a bad one but just where they they so love something you know that and they can possess it you know they actually can you know I just read this book which I'd recommend called The Art Thief which is a not did somebody read that? Yes. Uh, D, was it D? Who? No, Cynthia. Yeah, Cynthia was saying that it'd be a great one to pair with your book. Well, Michael Finkel, I just loved it. You know, I mean, I, I couldn't put it down. And, and you know, here's this art thief who believes that he can take better care of the work than any museum. Um, and so, and he never sold a piece, as you know, if you read it, he hid them away. I don't want to ruin it for other people who haven't read it. It's really, it's fun. And he does a great job of, of telling this guy's story and really, uh, Crime Reads, which is an online magazine, asked me to write about art theft. And the first thing I write about is Michael Finkel's book, because it just puts you inside that art thief's head in a way that is amazing. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I have to say that periodically I'll be in a museum and I write about this stuff so much. You know, I, I, I was um, this was a few years ago, but I was it was a big Cezanne show at the Museum of Modern Art. And I was standing there with a friend of mine. And there's this little Cezanne, it's like this big. And the thought that went through my head was, I could get that under my jacket. You can pocket that. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, I also worked in a museum. One of my first jobs was at the Whitney. And I know these paintings are bolted to the wall or there's an alarm system and you're going to get caught. You know, plus nowadays, everything's, you're being filmed. So, it's not, you know, I can't recommend it. But, you know, it, it um, there is that... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that tremendous desire. But I, I do think that art, big art collectors who have important work should at least loan those paintings as often as possible. They get scared to because of insurance, you know, but I, I think they're obligated. You know, if you, I, I met the guy who wrote, who, you know, um, found the, uh, the supposed Leonardo, you know, the, a few years ago that, that the Sheik, um, from Saudi Arabia bought and the painting has disappeared. You know, you know, that four, he spent $450 million on this, on this Leonardo. And it apparently it's on his yacht. Um, so nobody's getting to, to see it. And he hit, he was going to, 
give it to the Louvre for a show oh, right. for Leonardo's birthday. And the Louvre cast aspersions on the fact, you know, said it might be a fake, you know, a lot of people. And he that he that was it. He said, you can't have it. I'm never letting this painting go. So, um, but I, you know, and now it, you may have read uh, that the, a new Mona Lisa, there's another Mona Lisa that um, is going to be shown. I have to remember the facts. It was just today being, I read it. Uh, and they believe it's a Leonardo, the museum. I don't believe it. I looked at the paint, and I'm not an expert, but I looked at the painting and I went, mm, no, I don't think so. Um, you know, the Mona Lisa, Leonardo worked on it his whole life, and it was a commission that, that you know, this silk merchant uh, hired him to paint his third wife, and um, he never gave it to them. And I always wonder, did they give him a deposit? I mean, what was the deal? Did they lose their deposit? Because, you know, he took it with him and it was with him when he died right. in France, which is how it ended up That's in the French it. courts. And then Napoleon had it for a while on his bedroom wall. And then it ended up in the Louvre. But, um, you know, I mean, should anyone really own the Mona Lisa? I don't think so. You know, but right. I mean, I think that's a crazy, you know, that's a difficult question. And with these Monet's and Van Gogh's and Rembrandt's and, you know, all of these very famous artists, you just hate for them, their paintings to be locked away where we can't all see them. But it is, it's a tough question. It, it is a tough question. And I'm, I'm, you have some important paintings hidden somewhere, right? Oh, yeah. absolutely. I've got all sorts of paintings hidden on my bedroom wall. Um, yes, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> you know, I in my research, I've talked to um, FBI people, all these different people. And the FBI has an art squad uh, because art crime is so rampant. And they, what happened was there was a drug arrest for like some drug lord in New Jersey. Well, and it's it's like the Sopranos, you know, they broke into this guy's house because they thought they were making a drug arrest. There were no drugs, but his entire house was filled with stolen art, Monet, Van Gogh, Lautrec, and he had them in his house just everywhere on the walls in his bedroom, you know, and apparently he'd had them for years that he was just buying stolen art or trading in stolen art. So they well, didn't. Get sorry. Yeah, no, I just going to say they didn't get him for the drugs. But, but they, they got him for the stolen yeah. art. Well, yes, yeah. and I guess once it's stolen, that's the other issue is, you know, with some of these paintings that have been taken, you can't put them someplace public without being busted for it. That was all I was going to say. No, I mean, it, it's um, the FBI guy who I befriended told me lots of stories um, about, and like there were a couple of stories about, as he called them, amateur thieves who stole paintings and ended up being killed because you cannot fence a famous painting. You know, you get the people who like, for example, the people who stole the Isabella Stewart Gardner, that big theft yeah. 30 years ago, whenever it was, those paintings have never shown up again. And, you know, if you watch the Netflix series about it, you know, it's they say it was the Irish mob and it was this and they were used often stolen art is used as collateral in you know for drugs or for arms um and because you can't there's nothing you can do with them you yeah. can't put them on obviously can't put them up for auction but they can be held so that some you know somebody can lend you x millions amount of dollars and then you get the painting back uh so I think that the, whoever stole those Gardner paintings really did a, a horrible thing because they cut them out of the frames. They yeah. destroyed those paintings, you know. It's and, terrible. Yeah, I mean, Vermeer, we only, there are only a handful of Vermeers. They stole the only Rembrandt seascape that he ever did, you know, so. It's uh, sad. You it's just hope always, those haven't been destroyed. You know, you just hope that wherever they are, someday they will turn back up. But. I hope so. I hope they're in someone's basement. Yeah. You know, I don't. I don't know. It's been a long time, and they probably won't be in good shape because they were cut and then they were rolled up. Very it's bad thing crack. to do. Yeah. yeah, to do to an old painting. You yeah. Know? It's kind of mean, but um, yeah. Well. 
Thank you so much, Jonathan, for taking the time to chat with us. We really appreciate it. This was fascinating. So interesting. Great. And really I enjoyed everything we learned in your book, too. Oh, good. I didn't really answer anything about my book, did I? But, oh. but <laughs> well, we talked good. about the different parts of it. You talked yeah. about the Van Gogh part. Um, right. But we had a really interesting conversation. Good. That's all that. Yeah, me too. This is great. It's nice to meet you all. Thank you for reading the book. Thank you for uh, being here. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, so, what's your hey, next podcast? Um, my next, well, you know, December so quiet. So yeah. it's a lot of like roundups, like favorite books of the year or gift giving and things like that. So I do have um, John Clinch. He wrote The General and Julia. So uh -huh. I just interviewed him and that will come up in a couple of weeks. And then I think I have one other author. Um, and then it's a lot of kind of year end stuff or looking ahead stuff. Right, so. right, right. Well, I look forward to it because I always, I, I love podcasts when I'm in my studio in the back drawing or painting you know, or making a forgery. So, and I, I, I found yours a while ago and I've been listening to a lot of them. So thank you. That makes me happy. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So great. Thanks. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot.